So it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Parul Jori, uh, who is a postdoc in the Jensen Lab here at uh, ASU. Uh, Dr. Jori uh, joins us uh, af uh, after getting her PhD in evolution ecology and behavior at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, working with uh, Mike Lynch, who is also now here at Arizona State. <clears throat> Prior to that, uh, Dr. Jori got her BSc from St. Stephen's College in Delhi, India, and then a master's in biology from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Now, I'm really excited about Parul's talk today because she's gonna talk to us about developing a, a proper null expectation for demographic models while taking into account um, what she calls nuisance parameters or nuisance effects of, of uh, deleterious fitness effects distributed across the genome. And I'm really excited about this, you know, selfishly, um, because I'm trying to infer demographic history with some, some samples that, and some animals that I've been studying for, for many, many years. And I want you to tell me today what I've been doing wrong. So I'm super excited to hear uh, your research, which, which uh, is going to talk about a recent genetics and uh, bioarchive preprint article that you have out. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Noah. Thank you for uh, holding this seminar series and um, you know giving us an opportunity to talk about our work. Um, that's very important. As Noah introduced me, I'm a postdoctoral researcher with Jeff Jensen um, here. And today I will be talking to you um, about the role of non-adaptive processes in shaping genome-wide variation. So let's start um, today by talking about how evolutionary processes contribute to genetic variation and why it is important to study dynamics of non-adaptive processes in populations. Now we know that mutation is the primary source of variation in populations. I refer to variation here as within species sequence variation between individuals and one population. And um, here um, I depict a genome uh, that comprises of both functional regions and uh, non-functional regions. And these plain solid lines represent genomes of individuals in a population. Now mutations can occur either on these functional or these non-functional regions in the genome. While in non-functional parts of the genome, mutations have no consequences and can thus be largely considered neutral, new mutations at coding regions have been found to be mostly deleterious in several studies for many different species. So here, the x-axis is the strength of selection acting on the new mutation, and y-axis is the frequency of new mutations with a particular selective strength. So. Uh, really what this is showing you is that if you measure the strength of selection of every new mutation in a population, this is how the distribution would look like. And um, so as you can see here, um, there are a large number of deleterious mutations and a very small proportion of beneficial mutations. Um, usually when selection acts on deleterious mutations, it's called purifying selection. And when it acts on beneficial mutations, it's called positive selection. So purifying selection is a lot more common than positive selection in populations because new beneficial mutations are extremely rare. Now, while very strongly beneficial mutations fix quickly in populations, very strongly deleterious mutations also quickly get purged from populations. So most segregating variation that we observe in natural populations comprises largely of these effectively neutral and mildly deleterious mutations. And so this is one reason why it is absolutely essential to study non-adaptive forces that will predominantly govern the dynamics of these segregating mutations. Moreover, most natural populations are constantly experiencing changes in population size, which can affect genome-wide levels of polymorphism. For instance, population decline reduces variation uh, while population expansion can increase it. So population size change is a non-adaptive process that will shape genome-wide variation. And although it will affect variation at all sites, the sites that are not under selection in the genome uh, or alleles that are really completely neutral will be predominantly determined by such demographic factors. 
So one might say that a mutation that is at a non-functional region of the genome that happens to be completely neutral can be described entirely by population size changes and the rate of mutation. However, because sites are linked to each other on a genome, um, selection acting on nearby sites can actually determine the dynamics of these neutral mutations in the population. So let's assume here that the solid block represents a region of the genome that is under direct selection, that is it's functional. So any neutral mutation that occurs near the directly selected region could occur, say, on a background that has another beneficial mutation. In this case, the neutral mutation might sweep through the population along with the beneficial mutation, and this will result in decreasing variation at the neutral site. Alternatively, if the neutral mutation had occurred on a background um, which was next to a deleterious mutation, the neutral mutation would be lost from the population and not allowed to segregate. And this process is called background selection and it results in decrease of variation at the neutral site. Now we know that all of the evolutionary processes that I just talked about, they matter for, uh, for determining variation. But there has been an ongoing debate about whether patterns of neutral variation are predominantly affected by sweeps um, that are caused by positive selection or by other processes. Although historically as well, this has been a debate and has actually involved many population geneticists like Wright, Fisher, Gillespie, Kimura, and Ota, this debate was almost always um, restricted to variation that was observed at the directly selected site. Um, and in fact, we, we found out that Kimura and Ota were right and that most of the segregating variation um, is really uh, mildly deleterious or neutral. But now this debate is mostly restricted to the effects of selection on linked neutral variation. And uh, this has been a debate for so many decades because all of these evolutionary processes that we just talked about leave similar imprints in population genetic data, making it extremely challenging to disentangle them from each other in natural populations. And so the two questions that have sort of driven this research that I'm talking about today are what is the role of adaptive versus non-adaptive processes in shaping genome-wide variation? And how can we just dis disentangle evolutionary processes from each other using population genomic data? Now we think that it is difficult to resolve this debate because before quantifying the effect of more deterministic forces like positive selection, we need to fully account for the stochasticity that is generated by the joint effect of constantly operating non-adaptive processes in the population. Now, both population size changes and pure fang selection with its linked effects constantly affect variation in populations. So we think that these jointly represent the appropriate evolutionary, evolutionary null model on which the importance of more periodic processes like positive selection can be assessed. I should also say that an immense amount of work has been done in population genetics, both theoretical and computational, to study all of these processes independently of each other. However, accounting for them jointly has been difficult. For instance, although deleterious mutations are abundant, they are largely ignored and unaccounted for currently in population genetics. Most population genetic inference methods, for instance, the ones that infer demography or the ones that infer positive selection or sweeps, they do not account for the presence of these deleterious mutations. And so today I will be talking to you first about the effects of both fixing and segregating deleterious mutations in populations. I'll then talk about what are the consequences of not accounting for these deleterious mutations. I'll then talk about our efforts towards an analytical solution and then the computational solutions that we have come up with and their applications. Um, all of the work that I'm talking about today has been um, uh, done under the mentorship of Jeff Jensen, the, who you all know at ASU. Um, also, uh, Brian Charlesworth, who uh, is at University of Edinburgh. Kellen and Emma are two fantastic undergraduates um, who I've been mentoring and both have contributed heavily to a project each. So um, let's start by talking about what happens when a new mutation increases in frequency 
and goes to fixation. That is, it is present in all individuals belonging to the population. So when a new mutation goes to fixation, it will carry with it other neutral mutations linked to it that were present on the haplotype where the mutation first arose. So for a given recombination rate, if the mutation goes to fixation very quickly, then there will be no time for the recombination to act. So there will be a large region uh, where there will be a reduction in diversity. For the same recombination rate, if the mutation fixes slowly, right, then because of recombination, um, because recombination will have the time to break up the haplotypes, there will be a much smaller reduction in diversity around the site that fixed. And interestingly, the GMA showed in 1990 that right after neutral mutations fix in a population, the reduction in diversity is entirely dependent on the time it takes to fix in the population. So here the x-axis is time to fixation, and the y-axis shows you the reduction in nucleotide diversity. Uh, the y-axis is um, so simply a measure, uh, a way that we measure genetic variation in populations. Um, so genetic diversity is often measured by this statistic called nucleotide diversity, which is denoted by the symbol pi. And it is really just the probability that any two randomly chosen genomes in a population are different at a particular site. So what we see is that as the time to fixation of a mutation decreases, there is more reduction in diversity. Now, another sort of a counterintuitive and very interesting result um, that was arrived at long ago by Maria Mind Kimura in 1974 is that if a deleterious mutation with strength minus S fixes in a population, right, it takes the same amount of time as a beneficial mutation with strength plus S. Now, the intuition behind this is that although a deleterious mutation is much less likely to fix in a population than a beneficial mutation, the fixation can occur by chance, and when it will occur, it has to happen rapidly. So now we thought that because the total number of fixations is a function of the total input of mutations and the probability of fixation, um, and in case of deleterious mutations, right, the probability of fixation is very low, but the input of mutations is very high. So there must be a significant number of fixations that occur uh, that are just mildly deleterious. Correspondingly, we found that the very weakly deleterious mutations whose effects, um, that is two times population, time, population size times the selection coefficient is between minus one and minus five, they are about one fourth as likely to fix as a neutral mutation, which is actually quite substantial. And so first we wondered what, what effect these fixations of weakly deleterious mutations have on genetic variation. So first we performed simulations and we indeed found that the time to fixation of a weakly deleterious mutation with strength minus five is the same as the mean time to fixation of a beneficial mutation with strength plus five. Um, and this is also very similar to the mean fixation time of neutral mutations. Moreover, we found that the variance in these fixation time of mildly deleterious mutations is so large that some of the fastest fixations can occur in only n generations, which will mimic sweeps of beneficial mutations with selective effects of up to 40. We also investigated closely the reduction in diversity at linked neutral sites caused due to fixation of mildly deleterious mutations. Here, the x-axis is the distance from the selected site in units of recombination rate, and the y-axis is the nucleotide diversity relative to that when there is no fixation. We found that fixations of weakly deleterious mutations can reduce diversity to about 50% immediately post-fixation. But these effects remain restricted to small regions close to the target of fixation. For instance, in Drosophila, there is a 30% reduction in diversity for only about 40 base pairs around the site 
And this is because the number of recombination events every generation is quite large in Drosophila. Correspondingly in humans, the number of recombination events per generation is quite low. And so the reduction in diversity here will extend to about 4 kb. So what this suggests is that in regions of genome that, are, that have low recombination rates or species that have low recombination rates, fixation of weakly deleterious mutations will have larger effects. We also find um, that, uh, you know, we also asked what effect these fixations will have on average with repeated fixations, not just immediately post-fixation. And we find that diversity can be reduced up to about 20% in low recombination regions. So fixation of weakly deleterious and even neutral mutations can cause reduction in diversity at nearby neutral sites. And this effect is never really accounted for in population genetics. Now, most deleterious mutations will never really reach fixation, but they will simply be segregating in populations. And such segregating mutations tend to have a much more significant effect on nearby neutral mutations. So it turns out that when mutations are strongly deleterious, they decrease levels of diversity of nearby sites, which is something we talked about, and this process is called background selection. However, when the strength of selection against these deleterious mutations is small, they can really segregate in populations for a while before they get purged. And this can end up changing the allele frequency also of nearby neutral mutations. So background selection can result in an increase in the proportion of rare, real, rare alleles at these linked neutral sites. And what this means is that deleterious mutations can skew the expected distribution of allele frequencies at neutrality. For instance, shown here is a site frequency spectrum, or the SFS, which is basically a frequency distribution of your derived allele frequencies in the population. The black bar here shows you the expected SFS under neutrality and demographic equilibrium. And what it shows you is that 70% of all segregating alleles are present at a frequency of 0 to 0.1 in the population. The red bar show you the SFS of a neutral allele experiencing background selection under demographic equilibrium. As you can see, weaker purifying selection, which corresponds to milder deleterious mutations, generates stronger deviation of the SFS from neutrality. Now, it turns out currently in population genetics, we do not account for this deviation. That is, we assume that sites like synonymous sites, intergenic and uh, intronic sites that we consider neutral are completely neutral and that they are following this distribution shown in black. And we perform population genetic inference ignoring this deviation. For instance, demographic inference or inference of historical population size changes are performed using synonymous sites or sites from introns or intergenic regions, assuming that these are completely neutral. As you can see, most of these sites are basically right next to the functional sites, like non-synonymous sites. So they must experience substantial background selection, distorting the expected distribution of allele frequencies. So we suspected that not accounting for effects of linkage will confound the inference of demography. This is very likely because we already know that certain demographic histories distort the SFS in exactly the same direction. For instance, population growth. Here I have added the site frequency spectrum resulting from tenfold and twentyfold population growth under complete neutrality in green. As you see here, there is not much difference between the SFS from a population that experienced a tenfold growth and a population that is under complete equilibrium but has sites that are closely linked to other functional sites. We also know that some programs that infer demography do so by fitting the data to the SFS. So we decided to test to see if background selection can really bias demographic inference using two very different types of very widely used programs. So uh, one, we used a method that fits the demographic model to the site frequency spectrum from the data. And uh, the name of this program is Fast and Cole. We also used another very different and widely used method called MSMC. MSMC walks along a diploid genome 
and uses the positions of homozygous versus heterozygous sites to infer the time to the most recent common ancestor across the genome. And by using the length of these haplotype blocks that are not broken by recombination, MSMC can infer historical population sizes. So what we really did is we simulated human-sized genomes comprising of about 22 chromosomes of 150 MB each and mimicked the intron exon intergenic structure of human genomes. So in this case, the exons here experienced purifying selection, while all the introns and intergenic regions were completely neutral. We then used these completely neutral sites and performed demographic inference. So um, I'll walk through this figure here. Here, the black line shows you the true population sites that we simulated. And time here goes from right to left. Inferences of population size changes are given in red and blue with the two uh, corresponding um, um, programs that we used. So even when the true model has no size change and the population is at demographic equilibrium, recent growth is inferred by, most, by both of the programs. We also observe a pretty large underestimation of the true population size. Interestingly, when there really is recent growth, the inference is pretty accurate. However, if the population experienced recent decrease in size, then there are, the inference is, um, of the growth is even stronger. And so it's interesting to see that these different demographic histories produce different extent of linked selection and therefore different extent of biased misinference. In fact, as predicted, the higher the proportion of functional sites in the genome, the stronger is the misinference of demographic history. So demographic inference is sufficiently accurate if less than 10% of the genome is under selection, but it's highly biased if even 20% of the genome is under selection. Moreover, another group um, that inferred demographic histories when, you, when using different site types in human populations found different answers, um, uh, that is different parameters of the demographic history. So they use synonymous sites that are likely to experience substantial background selection, and they use some intergenic sites that have been predicted to experience relatively less background selection based on gene density, recombination rate, et cetera, and found that using synonymous sites leads to inference of stronger growth in African populations of humans uh, than when you use sites that experience less background selection, which is completely consistent with um, you know, how background selection would um, skew allele frequency patterns. And so really the effects of background selection are empirically observable in the data as well. So what I have shown you is that not accounting for segregating deleterious mutations can result in serious misinference of demographic history and two methods that use very different types of population genomic information are equally biased, suggesting that no current demographic methods are immune to misinference caused by background selection. In fact, these demographic inference methods are very highly cited and are also used across a very large variety of species, despite not accounting for their very different coding densities. Um, on top of that, um, demographic inference is used for many many things, not just for understanding natural history of populations, but also for detecting positive selection in natural populations. Um, it's useful for conservation efforts of endangered species, for predicting frequency of disease variants, etc. So, um, you know, what is a potential solution to this problem? Now, one solution is to be able to theoretically account for them for these deleterious mutations so that traditional methods can correct for their presence. This is quite a difficult problem and also um, involves precisely knowing the distribution of fitness effects. We have, however, made a few steps in this direction. So what, what we did is we were successfully able to obtain an analytical expression for reduction in diversity due to background selection. Now, a lot of theory has been worked out previously 
for background selection. Um, but an analytical expression has never been obtained before. And this was possible because we modeled the distribution of fitness effects to be a combination of four non-overlapping uniform distributions, where the first one corresponds to effectively neutral mutations, the second one weakly deleterious mutations, third one moderately deleterious mutations, and the last one is strongly deleterious mutations. Now, by changing the proportion of these four classes of mutations, we could sample any arbitrary shape of the DFE. The idea here is that um, if, if we have a functional region of length L and there is a neutral site at a, distant, at a distance Y from that functional element, can we predict the, redu predict the reduction of diversity at this linked neutral site due to this uh, functional region nearby it? And um, it turns out that this expression is a function of not only the distance between the two, but also of the distribution of select selection, selective coefficients acting on this um, region, which is denoted by this distribution phi s. More specifically, um, this expression can be written down to account for rates of recombination between the two sites, the rate of gene conversion, and also the specific rate of mutation at both of these sites. Um, right. So now as our DFE is described by uniform distributions, it allowed us to integrate these expressions over the selective effects quite easily and obtain analytical expressions for all possible DFE shapes. We also find uh, that our analytical solution can very closely predict diversity levels using simulations. Here the red dots are simulated data points and black dots show you the, our analytical predictions as we move away from a functional region here. Moreover, we have also demonstrated how if we know and account for this reduction in diversity due to background selection, we can predict the entire distribution of allele frequencies after a population size change. So here you see a population that experienced a decline. And then we sampled 20 individuals at this time point from this population. And then we made uh, what this shows you here is the site frequency spectrum um, of, uh, um, of those 20 individuals that we sampled. So the black bars here represent complete neutrality, while the gray bars correspond to extremely different DFE shapes that were characterizing pure fine selection in these populations. The red solid circles represent expected theoretical values. And what this is showing you is that it is really possible to account for background selection and accurately project the full site frequency spectrum after population size changes. And we hope to be able to apply this in practice Someday. It is, however, not that straightforward, especially because we cannot yet account for the variance in these estimates. So we sort of want a, a computational method um, that can specifically account for recombination rates, mutation rates, and gene density um, in a particular region of the genome, especially because these all of these factors can vary across genomes, uh, across the genome. We also want a method that can use various different statistics or information, not just, for instance, not just using allele frequency, but also using linkage DC equilibrium, et cetera, in order to be able to tease apart demography and selection. And we, we, we would like a method that can account for these linked effects of selection. So we employed a statistical framework called approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC, to infer demographic parameters, let's say in this case, the ancestral population size and the current population size. So ABC is a simulation based Bayesian method in which values of ancestral and current size are drawn from a prior distribution. We assume this distribution to be uniform as we had no idea or no, no reason to believe that any particular value was more likely than another. Simulations for all pairs of randomly drawn ancestral and current population sizes were conducted. And then the simulations are summarized using statistics like nucleotide diversity. And, and then we asked if this statistic is similar 
um, to the observed statistic in the data. Using this information, ABC generates a posterior distribution of most likely values of both of these parameters. So the idea here really was um, that we simulated a functional element of a specific length L with a specific recombination and mutation rate um, corresponding to a particular region of the genome. We assume that we knew nothing about the distribution of selective effects of new mutations that arise on this region. And so we simulated scenarios with all possible DFE shapes, characterizing possible purifying selection acting on that element. We then asked if it was possible to infer the change in population size experienced by this directly selected region using ABC. Because these simulations were performed such that these sites were all linked to each other, our method accounted for all effects of segregating and fixing deleterious mutations. In these plots, the light gray line shows you the true current size, while the dark gray line shows you the true ancestral size. Correspondingly, the grayish box plots, they represent the inference under complete neutrality, while the red box plots show you the inference by our method. First, if you look at the top panel, uh, which was simulated entirely under neutrality, as you see, there is no difference between the performance of these two methods as expected. But when there is purifying selection, uh, of course, inference under neutrality is completely um, biased as expected. But our method can reasonably estimate these population sizes. Now, you must have noticed that our method uses directly selected sites to infer population size history. This means that our method can be used on RNA-seq data or exome data, um, and especially can be used in non-model organisms where we don't know which sites are functional. We then wondered if we could do much better um, if we used non-coding regions linked to these functional elements as well. So uh, specifically, we wondered if we could infer both the distribution of fitness effects and the demographic history using ABC. The idea here was to use the recovery of background selection effects as we move away from a functional element. And this was done by calculating statistics in different windows in the non-coding regions, capturing the gradient of these linked effects. We found that our method performed extremely well. Here, the x-axis is the true value and the y-axis is the estimated value. The top four plots correspond to parameters of the distribution of fitness effects, and the bottom two correspond to the demographic history. So we see that we, we, our method could perform very well with where we could jointly infer both selection and demography. We can in fact infer all of these six parameters pretty well just from coding region actually um, without having any non-coding data, although there is some increase in error in this case. So there are a number of aspects of our framework that are extremely novel and are also very useful in practice. So first, we can fit multiple aspects of the data where we can account for allele frequencies, linkage disequilibrium, and divergence patterns. We can account for linked effects of segregating and fixing deleterious mutations. Also, uh, one can use functional regions directly to perform inference, which means that we can use exon data only, RNA-seq data that, has, that is actually available for many organisms, um, we can also infer the DFE of regulatory regions like promoter regions or enhancer regions. And this, these method can, methods can really be applied to non-model organisms very easily where we don't really know which sites are functional, which sites are not functional. On top of all of that, um, our method also makes no assumptions about selection on synonymous sites. So let me tell you why this is important. Um, this is actually because both experimental and computational avenues have demonstrated that synonymous sites are not always neutral and they're not neutral in many species. This is because it's been found that among the codons that code for the same amino acid, some codon codons are translated more accurately and efficiently than others. And for instance, in highly expressed genes, uh, for instance, highly expressed genes usually display highly biased codon usage towards the set of 
preferred codons. The synonymous sites may not be neutral in order to increase the translational efficiency. There are also studies that suggest that synonymous sites may be under selection to optimize the thermodynamic stability of mRNA secondary structures. And finally, because regulatory elements like splice sites and enhancers can overlap with exonic sites, some synonymous sites are under purifying selection to optimize the performance of those regulatory elements. Now, the current population genetic methods to infer selection or demographic history always assume that synonymous sites are neutral. So these methods, uh, what they usually do is that um, they use synonymous sites to infer demographic history. And then conditional on this specific demographic history, they infer parameters of selection. Now, if synonymous sites are not neutral, then uh, uh, the final inference could uh, be pre pretty biased. While our method should continue to be accurate in this scenario. So in order to test this, we simulated a case where 30% of synonymous sites were experiencing weak purifying selection. Now here the black bars uh, show you the true simulated value. The blue bars here show you our, the performance of our method and the pattern bar show you the performance of this very widely used method DFE alpha that performs inference of selection and demography in this two-step process that I just talked about. So the right hand side here shows you the fold change in N that is the, like the size change in, in population size. Um, and the left side here shows you the inference of the DFE. So as you would expect, D, uh, this is the case where uh, we simulated a population with constant size. Uh, DFE alpha in, in this case infers almost a twofold growth under equilibrium, and it underestimates the proportion of weakly deleterious class of mutations, while our method can accurately get both of them. The same thing holds true for both growth and decline, uh, where DFE alpha overestimates the fold change in growth and actually estimates growth instead of decline. Also, DFE alpha consistently underestimates the proportion of mildly deleterious mutations, and our method is able to accurately infer both of these. So now that we have a method um, that works accurately for uh, uh, coding parts of the genome as well, um, we applied our method to viruses, um, the influenza virus, uh, where we knew their specific complex demographic history. So influenza virus in this case had been passaged in the lab with multiple bottlenecks, and we knew the experimentally measured population sizes at the beginning and end of each of these passages. So in this case, we simulated the exact demographic history, which is actually very complex. And we asked if it was possible to infer the distribution of fitness effects accurately. We were able to reasonably measure these fitness effects with larger error in the weekly deleterious class. And our ABC method could reasonably infer the DFE in influenza viral populations. And this inference matched very well with uh, experimental measures of the DFE. We then applied our method to a natural population of Drosophila melanogaster, the Zambian population from Africa. So here you see that all previous estimates of population size changes are in these colorful lines. Um, and time again goes from right to left. So as you see, uh, this population was previously inferred to have undergone recent growth. Um, here the X axis is a number of generations. Um, yeah and uh, recent growth had been inferred in almost all the cases. Instead, we infer almost no population size change at all, which is shown in the black line here. And um, uh, instead, we infer a much uh, larger proportion of mildly deleterious class of mutations as compared to previous studies, again shown in colors here. So to remind you here, our inference is exactly in line with expectation 
Um, by neglecting background selection, one will infer recent growth, even if the population is under equilibrium. And we account for this background selection, and thus we are able to correct for this misinference and accurately infer population in equilibrium. Um, we were, in fact, able to also explain all different uh, measures of uh, or different statistics uh, in the population. So here, the, the, the three panels that you see, uh, the first panel is for um, uh, exonic regions. The second panel is for the linked region right next to the exons. And then the third panel is for regions that are less linked to the exons. Um, and uh, the rows here correspond to different statistics that we measured from this Drosophila Zambian population. Um, so here is pi that you are already familiar with. It's, it's a measure of genetic variation. Um, here is Watterson's theta. That's another measure of genetic variation that is skewed towards measuring rare alleles. And here is R square, which is a measure of linkage disequilibrium in the population. In all these cases, the histogram shows you our sort of simul our model that we inferred, and the black uh, line here shows you the Drosophila data. So as you can see, we are able to pretty well explain the Drosophila data um, in, in, in many different dimensions. So here I would like to pause and um, just sort of summarize what I have talked about so far. Um, um, I've talked about how fixing and segregating mildly deleterious mutations not only reduce variation, but also modify allele frequency of nearby neutral alleles. And if we don't account for these deleterious mutations, they can bias population genetic methods that assume complete neutrality, like demographic inference. By accounting for background selection, we can theoretically predict allele frequency patterns even after population size change. And by making statistical methods that account for selection, we can get accurate inference of both demography and selection. And application of our method to Drosophila melanogaster yields more accurate estimates of both demography selection and explains genome by patterns pretty well. Now revisiting a question that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, because we know that positive selection can also affect variation in populations, we were curious to know how that can affect the distribution of the statistics that we observed and whether it can help explain the observed data in Drosophila better. So we evaluated this by looking at four cases where positive selection is either common or rare and weak or strong, all four combinations of it. In this case, common means five, we, we, we assumed is 5%, rare is 1%, strong, uh, is a 2ns of 1,000, and weak is a 2ns of 10. So we looked at the effect of positive selection by first simulating our inferred model in, uh, that comprises of demography and purifying selection in Drosophila. And uh, then we added positive selection on top of it. Um, so, so here, our uh, inferred model would be in dark gray and the model with positive selection is in light gray. So in the case where selection is strong, but only rare, you can see that the two models with and without positive selection have very different expectations of this, these two statistics. Here I'm showing you nucleotide diversity, again, something you are familiar with, and haplotype diversity, which summarizes linkage disequilibrium in populations. The red line here shows you the actual observed data from D. melanogaster in Zambian populations. And as you can see, the data is, is always consistent in this case with um, an absence of positive selection, with such strong positive selection. Um, in fact, when positive selection is strong and common, um, these distributions are even further away from each other and the data is even more consistent with um, simply demography and purifying selection. Next, we um, simulated weak positive selection. When positive selection is weak, whether it is common or rare, most statistics are almost entirely unchanged. Again, you see nucleotide diversity and haplotype diversity. 
and that basically there's no difference between presence and absence of positive selection. When weak selection is common, um, it actually results in a very large and very large divergence values, which are not really consistent with the observed data. And so what we conclude here is that um, an extremely small fraction, much less than 1% of all mutations being strongly beneficial might be consistent with the data. And uh, although common and weak positive selection seems highly unlikely, rare and weak positive selection is completely consistent with the data as well. Although it does not change any statistics that we would already observed uh, with the null model. We thus conclude that demography and purifying selection alone are sufficient to explain most patterns of observed data in Drosophila melanogaster populations. And we conclude that positive selection is most likely not common, that it is definitely not strong and frequent. So here a point that I would like to make is that by forming an appropriate null model, our approach allowed us to reject a very specific evolutionary scenario that is of strong and frequent positive selection in these populations, which itself is quite powerful and important. An alternative approach would be to have no null model, but to simply assess the fit of multiple models. But one has to be cautious going down that avenue. For instance, one can fit a model of growth quite confidently to an equilibrium population experiencing background selection, but that wouldn't reveal its true evolutionary history. Similarly, one can almost always fit a model of positive selection to any observed pattern, especially when only a single statistic is considered. So it does not, however, make that a correct estimate. Um, our work thus emphasizes the need to have an evolutionary null model and to be able to infer parameters of that model jointly. So I would um, end by telling you that we have been able to uh, create a frame, framework that represents this null model, uh, which we propose um, accounts for evolutionary processes that are certain to be occurring in natural populations, against which contribution of periodic processes like po positive selection can be better assessed. Um, we also see that it is possible to disentangle the effects of demographic history and purifying selection using population genomic data and that both of these are sufficient to explain patterns of genome-wide variation in Drosophila. This, however, remains an open question in other species, and that is something um, for the future um, uh, to really look at. So with that, I would like to thank you all for listening, and I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Jeff Jensen, uh, my collaborators, Brian Charlesworth, Hannes Becher, both at University of Edinburgh, Mike Lynch, who is also um, uh, part of the project for examining the effects of fixing weekly deleterious mutations, uh, both of the undergraduate researchers without whom this would not be possible, and a special thanks to Susanna Pfeiffer and both Jensen and Pfeiffer lab members. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pablo. That was wonderful. Um, I really like this photo you have up of everyone. It's very, it's very appropriate given the, the current holiday season, although we're yes. not able to be together like that. I'm going to open it up. We have time for a, a few questions from, let's say, the, the non-students in the office, in the audience right now, um, because you're going to get some to spend a little time with some of the students, both the grad and undergrad, af after I kick everyone else out in a few minutes. So if you have any questions, you can type it into the chat. I'll read it. You can raise your hand. You can unmute. I'll, I'll kick it off with a, a, a comment, then, then sort of a question. I guess the, not even a comment. So are you, are you implying with a lot of this work that with your simulations and, and showing that there, there's lots of background selection going on, that all demographic models that have been published to date are wrong? or to some well, extent are wrong because it's pervasive? Right, so I mean, I think there are two things. One is if the genome really doesn't have that much functional region, like if it is below 10%, your, the estimates are most likely at least close to what they are supposed to be. 
you know, uh, background selection has to be more than probably the, the, you know, like there has to be enough functionally important sites in the genome. So uh, in some cases, I think it will be fine. Um, the other scenario is that in many cases, demographic inference is um, sort of like um, done along with like fossil records and things like that, which is a separate, um, you know, so if you account for that, we're not talking about accounting for that, we're looking at only molecular data. So of course, if you account for that, maybe you're able to actually um, somewhat get a more accurate estimate. Um, Right, and and the other the other question is, um, as I said, that it, it does actually depend on the demographic history as well, right? So if you really did have recent growth, you're probably actually estimating it fine. And so I can't say that every demographic uh, history published is wrong, but yeah, I think a lot of them would be affected by background selection. Yeah, and. Uh, like if I think about a lot of the, let's say, PSMC style plots that I've seen in many papers of pretty much every genome that's been published recently, you always see some recent growth. <laughs> so that could just be, that could be wrong, that it's actually, they stayed stable or declined. And this is that's, all due to background selection. Yes, that's exactly it. And actually it's, it's even more complicated. We, we even looked at what happens, you know, with these PSMC, MSMC plots, when even when there's no selection. But if you use like say eight individuals or four individuals, you will always estimate recent growth, even when there's nothing. And so, you know, that's probably what's, I mean, a lot of that is probably happening in, in real data. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Any questions from the crowd? On these Zoom meetings, we need to give everybody a little bit of time to, to mm -hmm. warm up. So you're saying that that 10%, like if less than 10% of the genome is functional, then this might not be an issue. But how are we defining functional? Like if you're, you were you were using functional as like genic regions, right? Which in humans is less than 2% of the genome, right? And also most primates and mammals in general. But like, there's a lot of other functional stuff in there. So it's really hard to just like say how much is functional, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think we used exons as sort of a model to, to define functional, but it meant functional anything, you know, like those those regions could represent regulatory regions or enhancers or promoters or whatever, because when you do look at human genomes, there are these non like there are these conserved regions right in non coding regions. And so we're kind of just assuming that it's you know, it's just kind of a model to say that it's it's a random chunk of the genome that's functional. But yes, I mean, then there are microRNAs, et cetera. So you really, um, it's really about the total functional part of the genome. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to, to thank uh, Dr. Jory for, for presenting to our group today. I hope everyone join me in, in thanking her for a wonderful presentation.